T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Flight control, we have no concerns. So in my fourth grade science class, Mrs. Callison handed us some pencils, Dixie cups, and straws, and had us build our own wind anemometers. And our, my classmates and I would take these out to recess with us, and we could measure the wind speed. And I thought this was the greatest device of all time. I could now understand what wind speed meant and, and relate that to the weather forecast. And I was so excited to take my little anemometer out to my grandma and grandpa's farm in western Iowa. And I would take it all around the farm and, and record my measurements and then I would go back and sit with my grandma and grandpa and, and tune into the weather forecasts. And as farmers, they were always, always dialed in to what the weather was looking like for the next few days. And I would see my grandma and grandpa take in this information and, and make actions on that, decide when to plant their crops or bale their hay. So I quickly became aware of how important our weather forecasts are for, for all of us, for making those day-to-day -day decisions. Now, in ingrained in that day-to-day -day weather are, are extreme weather events. These are the things that, that make the headline news, the floods, the droughts, the wildfires, all things that, that can create economic hardships for people like my grandpa and for a lot of us. So historically, humans as a civilization have been able to, to withstand and, and thrive through those events, and we learn to cope with them. But unfortunately, with, with climate change, that's going to become more and more difficult to do. As our climate change, we're going to see more and more of these events, more intense, more severe, and, and folks like my farmer, my grandpa, who's a farmer, are, are going to have a challenge with, with coping with these. And my grandpa has no hesitation in telling me that the weather and climate he sees today in western Iowa is, is not the same that he grew up with. And extreme weather events are a big piece of that. So he's not alone in thinking that. And in fact, two-thirds of American adults say that they're already seeing impacts from climate change in their local communities. And that comes from a 2019 survey from the Pew Research Center. So if, if so many of us are already starting to see these impacts, what's, what's holding us back from, from making those changes that we need? And I think there's a couple factors going on. First, there's, there's just uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty. Extreme weather events can be very problematic to predict and understand. And when we add in climate projections and climate science, we're looking at long time periods that are, are difficult to interpret. The second aspect is we, we live in a world of limited, limited resources, finances, manpower. We have lots of, of competing interests dialing in for all that information and all that knowledge. So not having good data to help drive home those decisions is something that we're hearing from, from our legislators, from our, our, our business owners and community planners who, who want that information, that knowledge to help them advocate for why it makes good sense to invest in those solutions. Now with that climate change, we're seeing we're seeing more and more of a demand for, for tangible information. So relating what climate change actually means on the ground. So if we can translate climate information into, into projections, into dollar damages of, of what we're going to experience, we can start to provide these folks with some information to, to have in their back pocket. So this idea is something that, that my colleagues and I recently worked with the state of Colorado to, to develop for all 64 counties in the state. We wanted to quantify a measurement of risk. What are those, those folks going to feel and face in the coming decades? So in order to pull this off, there's, there's really two main ingredients. We need a weather and climate input. These come from our, our observations in our backyard. The rainfall, temperature, wind speed, all things that we've been measuring for decades, even centuries. So we, we have a good understanding of, of how the weather has looked in the past. And on the future looking side, we have our, our climate science community. These are the, the experts who are developing computer simulations of, of what our future weather patterns are going to look like in the coming decades. And the second piece we need here are, are, are observations of, of impacts from extreme weather events. So here in Colorado, for example, we love our outdoor recreation. Tourism is a big part of our economy. And we have some really good data out there as far as how many people go skiing on a given year or purchase a whitewater rafting ticket, buy a fishing license. And we also have data sets that that come from our federal government, things like the U.S. Department of Agriculture's crop productivity measurements of how much, how much crop and, and livestock are we producing on any given year. And when we take those two data sets and combine them into a statistical model, we can develop these relationships on how things have played out in the past in terms of extreme weather and the resulting impacts, and then project that into the future. 
And when we do that, we, we come up with this unit of measurement called an annualized damage. And this is, this is just a simple way of, of spreading out the costs that occur year over year over a long time period. So we know that floods and droughts and wildfires don't happen every year. And when they do, we see differing impacts from one year to the next. So if, if we can spread those out over a time period, we can come out, come out with a single value to help us hone in on, on what, what we face. So another way to think about this is through the lens of a homeowner. As a homeowner, during the course of that home's life, you're probably going to have to repair the roof or get a new water heater. And we don't necessarily know when those expenses are going to happen, how frequently they may be, may be coming up, and we don't necessarily know what the repair bill is going to be. But we can estimate and we can budget and plan for that, put money in that rainy day savings so that when those do expenses do happen, we have the funds to, to pay for that. So we can kind of think of this annualized damage in a, in a similar fashion. Now I mentioned we, we did this for the state of Colorado, and I, I want to give you a couple examples of, of what this actually looks like so you can start to think about how we can use this information in our communities and our businesses. So if we hone in on, on the agriculture sector, folks like my grandpa, these are our farmers and our ranchers who are producing both our crops and our livestock. And, and this group can be especially vulnerable to drought. We know water is a limited resource here in the West, and during drought, that's even more so. So these folks are, can experience lost revenues or added expenses that, that add up and, and impact their bottom line. So in the study, when we looked at how things have played out in the recent past, so looking at the past 30 years or so, we can come up with an estimate of about $140 million is what traditionally we, we've experienced here in Colorado in terms of drought damages. Now when we add in that, that future climate regime, so 50, 2050, 30 years down the road, if we look at the climate conditions, we can see that damage grow to about $510 million. So that's nearly a quadrupling over where we are right now. So that, that is the cost of doing nothing. That's what we're honing in on and understanding. Now I just want to give one more example. Here in 2020, wildfires are setting records all over the West, including Colorado. And when we performed the same, same methodology, same analysis, we honed in on, on, our on our building infrastructure. So these are our homes, our businesses, and added in the cost of fighting wildfires, we can start to look at uh, what that damage looked like, again, over the past 30 years or so up to current. And that value is about $160 million across the entire state. And now, for wildfire, when we add in the climate change component, so a warmer climate, as well as our population growth, so adding more people to the landscape along with a warmer climate, we see that damage almost triple to about $450 million in terms of annualized damages. So I, I hope these, I, these numbers give you a sense of, of what we can do with this information, this cost of doing nothing. These are the damages and expenses that, that we can expect to face in the coming decades. So it starts to give us a sense of if we want to avoid or reduce some of those, we need to start investing in solutions now so that we can avoid those and we can become more resilient and rebound when they happen. And if we do that, if we, if we can come up with these estimates, we start to give those legislators and those business planners a tool and a resource to, to understand, to come to the table and advocate for, for real solutions. So things like redesigning our building codes or, or um, subsidizing cover crops. These are all things that we know have upfront expenses and costs, but we, we can now make a business case for why those are smart decisions. And in that vein, I really like the, a, a quote by the writer Jeff Kohler who said that, Farming isn't a battle against nature, but a partnership with it. And I really feel that that's a mind frame that, that we all need to have, not just our farmers. Moving forward, we need to have a solid understanding of, of where we're heading, knowing that we're already on this trajectory of increased risk, increased damage from these extreme weather events. We need to start to make these solutions now to help avoid some of those. So very similar to my wind anemometer, we all need that tool, that resource, that really helps us relate to what, what is the price tag on climate change in terms of extreme weather events. So the idea of having this cost of doing nothing is that tool to give us the knowledge, give us the power, so that we can look at the price of inaction and start to advocate for action, to have these solutions, have these resilient strategies that we can deploy to our communities and our businesses and, and build a stronger economy. Thank you.